the sheriff pulled up into my sister's driveway one time and um, said, there's a warrant. And I said, oh, lovely, who's the warrant for? And he said, who's the warrant for? I said, okay, can I, may I please see the warrant? And then I just said, where's the bond that's attached to this warrant? You know, I can't allow entry. I can't permit entry without a bond being attached to this warrant. So, see, um, I'm not sure exactly what Mark said or did not say, but I know he did say something about um, uh, where's the bond. And a judge, and a cop just said, uh, the, the sheriff's department, the deputy, whatever, just asked him, are you Mark? You know, and he's like, uh, is, uh, you know, can I see the bond? And he said, are you Mark? And he's like, well, you know, um, you know, or, you know, are you ordering me to give you my name? He says, are you Mark? And then, like, the third time, Mark said, yes, I'm Mark. And that was it. And they arrested him. So, like I said, it, a, cop will, a cop will stand there all day, and he'll just keep saying, are you Mark? Are you Mark? Are you Bali? Are you Bali? Are you Gus? Are you Gus? Are you call? Are you call? He'll just stand there like a parrot all day. That's all he's going to do. So all you got to do all day is it, it's just a, it's, it's a silly game, but it's a game of being a parrot. Just keep saying, you know, just repeat what you say because all he's doing is repeating what he's saying. You know, he will stand there all day. He'll stay there for the, his eight-hour shift, and he'll just keep asking you, are you Bali, are you Bali, are you Bali? And then he'll get somebody else. The next eight hours. Yeah, in the next eight hours, he'll get somebody else to say, are you Bali, are you Bali? And then somebody else will come in the next eight-hour shift and just stand at your door and say, are you Bali, are you Bali, are you Bali? So you got to know how to t handle these folks. You see what I'm saying? If you could say, all you have to say is that your jurisdiction, you know, does not lie. In this jurisdiction, your jurisdiction does not lie past this threshold. Obviously, if you had jurisdiction to enter this threshold, you would not be standing outside my door. You would be kicking in my door right now. You see what I'm saying? If they had jurisdiction to be inside your house, they wouldn't even bother knocking on the door and asking. They'd just come kicking in the door, and they'd just say, you're coming with us. They wouldn't stand there and ask for eight hours. You mark. They'd take a look at his photo on, like, a on a, uh, you know, on his driver's license or on uh, previous arrest records or uh, they'd ask his neighbor, is that Mark? And everybody'd say yes, and they just, they'd just kick in the door and drag you out. But obviously, if they got a warrant, they must have to operate under certain rules and certain procedures. So when he was in his home, he was safe. And that's why I keep telling people all the time, if you're in your home, you're safe. You know, it's like... Um, you can't force somebody to open the door and demand that they answer you. So, um, like I said, poor Mark, like I said, he just collapsed under, like, three questions. Are you Mark? Are you Mark? Are you Mark? You know, and I was like, holy cow, man. You know, that's it's sad when, um, you know, um, somebody doesn't um, have the ability to just uh, practice this before the cops show up at the door. Like, what would you do? What would you say? Well, Carl, like you said before, a lot of it is being able to think on the go, you know, being able to think, you know, uh, because like you said, it's a, it's a word game, and you just got to know how to think, you know, think on the go. Well, yeah, just like what happened with Bali in court the other day, you wanted me to come back to England for that. And I said, no, nah, you can handle it. It's just, you know, just you got to go at it. And uh, like he said, when he called me up, he was all upset. And he said that they wouldn't recognize me as because I wasn't a party to the case. And I said, well, why didn't you just ask the judge, can I please see that claim that's before you? And the judge would say, can you please have the bailiff sh show me the claim? And it's like, oh, Dad, you know, his dad's name is Bashim. I said, uh, and he'd say, uh, Bashim, uh, do you mind if I add my name to this claim? And Bashim would say, no, go ahead. And he'd say, okay, Balraj, okay. And he'd hand it back to the judge. He'd say, like, okay, now I'm a party to this case. Now I have standing. And Bali's like, oh, it was that easy? It's like, yeah, it was that easy. Because that's all the defendants did, what the wrongdoers did. They wanted to add themselves on. So they just said to the judge, can we add, us, yeah, can we add ourselves on? And the judge was like, yeah, sure, join the party. So all Bali had to do was jump on. He said, yeah, I want to be a part of this party too. Right now I'm outside the door. I want to be. I want to join this party. I want to be allowed into this venue. That's right. Yeah. I, I'm going to be a part of this. Yeah, that would have done the same thing, couldn't it? Yeah, it would have taken him two seconds. Yeah. But like I said, it's just it's just acting at, on the seat of your pants, you know, just acting on the fly. Yeah. It's whether you do it then, or one week later, or one month later. 
ideally it's on the day, but sometimes you don't you don't hear you don't think it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so but like I said, um it's the same thing with um like I said with, with like I said with with uh, anybody, like say somebody came knocking on your door to sell you uh, encyclopedias or or vacuums or brushes and they came knocking on your door. And they said, hey, you know what, um, we'll give you this lovely set of dictionaries and encyclopedias or vacuum for $100. And then he politely declined. And then he pulls out a gun and says, no, if you don't want the deal, uh, you know, I'm, you, you're going to accept the deal. You know, so like I said, that's what everybody's afraid of. With the policeman, they're afraid the policeman's going to eventually just pull out the gun and just say, you know what, enough of this. And so it's like somebody selling a vacuum or brushes or encyclopedias come knocking on your door, and you go, no, thank you, and you close the door, you expect them to walk away. But when a cop's knocking on your door and he's offering you the contract or he's telling you to accept this warrant, and you say, uh, you know, I, I respectfully decline, you expect the next thing he's going to do is pull out a gun and say, well, we don't care. You're coming with us anyway. So, like I said, you know, it would have been simple for Mark to say, you know, uh, um, are, you, are you questioning me? He says, are you Mark? And old Mark had to say that appeared to be in the form of a question. At any time that I'm to be questioned, I require that my attorney present, is this is this questioning? Are you questioning me? And he said, are you Mark? He's like, well, I wish to remain silent for anything I might use my views against me in a court of law. Are you here in an official capacity? as an officer of the court. And he said, are you Mark? And say, I'll take that as a yes, that you're here, as, you know, talking to me as an officer of the court. And he said, at this time, I wish to be let alone. He says, are you Mark? He said, I'm going to close my door now, and I wish to be let alone. You know, and just close your door. And that's it. And the cops are going to just sit down there, and they're just going to wait for you to go to work. But they're... <laughs> They're just going to put somebody outside your door 24 hours, seven days a week until you eventually walk out, which you will eventually have to walk out. But while you're in your home, they, they can't they can't come in. So as soon as you open that door, as soon as you uh, invite them in, or as soon as you uh, step out, you're, you're under their control. You're in their world. You're in their jurisdiction now. So like I said, it's a shame when people just, you know, can't... Um, you know, keep it together and just realize, hey, you know what? I got some time now. I'm in my house. Yes, they're going to keep knocking on my door. You know, I'm going to, uh, you know, ask the man, what's his name? You know, the cop's name. What's his name? It's like, what's your name? It's like, Bob, what's your badge number? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, great. You know, I'm going to make a claim that you're uh, interfering with my right to be let alone. You know, I wish you to, you know, cease and desist and uh, leave me in peace. And if he keeps knocking on the door, well, then there's going to be a claim that he's going to be able to file against this man for trespassing on his property. So, um, like I said, there's just all kinds of ways to go at it. But if Mark had some more time, you know, Mark had the wherewithal to close the door or not even answer the door. I have no idea. So he knocked on my door right now. You'd have to be out of your effing mind if you think I'd open it or talk to anybody. I couldn't care less. They could stand out there and turn purple. I couldn't care less. You know, one, because I live in the middle of nowhere. And so, uh, I, like, Mark, Mark would probably be embarrassed that he, had, you know, the cops are surrounding his apartment and they're pounding on his door. So he's probably embarrassed with his, uh, he seems to be that kind of sensitive kind of guy that he actually gives a damn what his neighbors think of him. But me, I couldn't care less. You know, the neighbors around here say, hey, right, calls, you know, you know, F those cops. You know, call, I, I expect call to answer the damn door. That's right. That's call style. You know, so my neighbors would expect me to say, who cares? You know, they're knocking on the door, so what? You know, they got, I got no business with them. You know, they, if, you know especially if they want to uh, just give me some silly piece of paper about not appearing in traffic court. That's ridiculous. Because Mark appeared in traffic court, and he was there from like uh, 1 o'clock until 2 o'clock. And what was funny is... um. Uh, you can almost see the prosecuting attorneys when the judge finally probably did walk in at 2, 3 o'clock, whenever he did finally walk in, and he called out Mark's name, they probably said to each other, uh, the, the judge probably said, is there Mark, you know, present in court? 
and they all just sat quiet and looked at their papers and shuffled and looked at the ceiling. And then the judge said, no, there's no mark in court? Okay, then I issue a warrant out for his arrest. See, now the, the prosecutors, they could have been decent to the judge and to Mark and said, yes, he was here and he left a notice that, yes, you know, I was here for an hour. I got better things to do. I, I my, my life isn't to be, uh, you know, my, I know I was told to be here at 1 o'clock. I was here at 1, you know. I, I'm here for an hour. You know, you're not here. I got things to do. Or I got to go to the hospital. Or I got doctors. Or I got to pick my kid up from school. I got time to sit around here all day and waste my time. If you want to be in contempt of court, Judge, and you don't want to show up on time like you said that you would be, we were all summoned to you to appear in court on this day at this time. If you can't be bothered to show because you've got to go to the doctor or you've got to go pick up your kid or you just don't feel like showing up, uh, you're in contempt of court, Judge, not me. And I'm going home. i got things to do. So he left a nice little notice and he went home. So like I said, but I can almost guarantee what the prosecutors did when the judge came in and he called out Mark's name eventually and Mark did an answer. It, if you haven't been in the United States court, it takes two seconds for the judge to say, issue a warrant out for his arrest. Because that's what will happen. You know, the judge will call out his name or the, the bailiff lady or the court clerk will call out his name. And the judge will like look around waiting to see if somebody's walking up. And then he'll say, call his name again. You know, call his name again. Nobody walks up. The judge will look over her and say, "Issue out a warrant for his arrest." And then the, the prosecutor could have jumped up and said, "I wouldn't do that if I was you, sir." Why? Because he was here. What? He was here, and he left a notice for you. Oh, really? What did it say? He said, "Well, you told me to be here at one thirty. I was here at one o'clock. It's now two o'clock. I'm going home. I got things to do. I don't know where you are. I don't know why you're in contempt of court, but I'm going home." You need me again, reschedule for another appointment, but right now I'm a very busy man. Something simple like that. And that's all he had to tell the judge. He's like, and the judge would have probably said, oh, really? Okay, then uh, you know, the judge probably would have stopped and thought about it. It's like, hmm, before he issued a warrant for his arrest, yeah, maybe you know he was here at 1.30. Maybe he did have a, uh, maybe he felt like he was having a heart attack. Maybe he did have to go get his kid. Maybe... He had to go into the hospital for something. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? But I know the prosecutors are probably just laughing their asses off saying, oh, well, that's going to fix that smart guy. We're going to let him get a warrant out for his arrest. The only problem is now Mark's going to be able to go after that guy who issued the warrant. And the, the, the man who issued the warrant happened to be the judge at that time. So the judge made a mistake. And that mistake is costing Mark some time from his life. And uh, But what I said... Somebody like me, when somebody like me goes to jail or somebody like a Dean Clifford goes to jail or somebody like a Gus, we start talking to the people in jail like crazy, the the other inmates. And we start explaining to them all the fun you could have being in you know jail, you know, all the fun you could have when you go before the judge. So uh, it's kind of like, like when Dean Clifford did that, he's like considered like a troublemaker and they put him in solitary confinement, you know? Because, because he's given he's given the inmates too many ideas that the court system doesn't want to get out there. They don't want to have to deal with. Like saying it's the Crown versus, uh, you know, uh, Joe in Canada. And it's like, who's the Crown? It's like, I, I never did anything to the Crown. You know, I've never met this Mr. or Mrs. Crown. I'm sure there's plenty of people in England or even in the United States phone book. I'm sure there's plenty of people named Crown in a phone book, you know. Bob Crown, Joe Crown. I'm sure you could look in the, uh, you know, in a phone book and find plenty of people whose last name ends in Crown. And it's like I don't remember doing anything wrong to Bob Crown or Susie Crown or any any Crown. I don't think I've ever met the Crown family. I don't think I've ever been, you know, done anything wrong to anybody named Crown. So um, that's what I'm saying. That Dean Clifford kind of guy, or me, we'd have a lot of fun, you know, being locked up because all the inmates would want to talk to us rather. Just like when Gus said that he went to jail, um, all the inmates would come and ask him all kinds of questions. You there, Gus? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know. Yeah. I, I mean, they people come in and they're looking for information. You know, they they want yeah. to know what can I do about this. And the other guys, you know, if you've been there a while, they point they point to you and say, go talk to that guy. Because they want to play cards. They don't want to be answering questions. 
Right. Or they don't really know the answers. Well, that's so that's, <laughs> right. So like I said, what happened on our, and what's funny, it's like a Dean Clifford. I mean, we have a captive audience. We know we have hundreds of inmates there that ain't going to go nowhere. So that they're going to listen to us, <laughs> and we might be able to actually get through to some of these people. And it was the same thing like I told everybody, the Best Judge Judy episode. I got to download it because it's only less than three minutes long. Is when Judge Judy looked and told the nuns that their case was dismissed. And they said, that's crazy. They said to the nun, the nun said to the to the judge, they said, this black guy's making a, a joke out of this. And she's like, I do see him laughing. I know he, he knows, he, but he's been in prison most of his life. Almost his whole entire adult life, he's been in jail. He knows the law. He knows it's your word against his word, and I can't use his past against him. I can't use the fact that he's been in jail, you know, like 30 out of 40 years of his life. I mean, you are all good nuns, and these are all orphans who bear witness. You have no third-party impartial witness. He knows that. He knows all he has to say, that this your word is as good as mine. And uh, there's absolutely nothing I could do to rule in your favor, because this man says that he, you have him mistaken with another black man, that all these black men look alike to you white people. And um, he's, he wants to go home, be let alone. So I got to leave him alone, and I got to let him go home. See, because that's jailhouse knowledge. You know, most people who've been in jail a long time actually know how to act when they go to court, know how to keep their mouths shut, know how to say the very bare, basic, simple things, put it in writing, and uh, be done, and go home. And uh, you could say, well, that's sad, you know, that, you know, these people learn how to manipulate the system. Oh, well, that's what you get, you know, when you go to court enough times, you learn learn their rules. And, you know, you learn how to uh, play by their rules, and you could use them for your own advantage. So, like I said, back to the the monk is um I don't know if he's using this time to his advantage if all of a sudden like he's got you know ten twenty thirty forty people you know like his new uh new new students and new disciples and new you know <laughs> who who want to follow him and you know as he's writing all kinds of paperwork for them but uh like I said, I know if I went to jail it would be almost impossible for me to get any sleep because I guarantee one person after another would be asking me, "Hey, can you write this for me? Can you write this for me?" And I'd be writing like crazy, you know, the whole time I was there. I'm sure people would just be asking me to fill out paperwork for them. And, um, but like I said, I don't know how he's using this time. Is he using it as a learning experience or is he using it to teach others? And like I say to people, man, God puts you in some interesting positions. And uh, he's a very uh, pleasant guy, that guy, Mark. You know, he's, he's knowledgeable. And uh, he seems to do uh, fairly well you know, teaching people. So he, uh, maybe he was meant to be he put he, there to reach a whole bunch of people real quick. He he did say he was teaching people, and uh, he says everybody says he's nuts, but within, <laughs> two or three, within two or three hours, they all come back and want his opinion <laughs> after they've had a chance to mull it over a little bit. <laughs> he, says, uh, he, he says he's teaching everybody to, to go to court and ask for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's it. Just bring the man or woman I've trespassed upon, you know, so, you know, I could, uh, so I could be given forgiveness of what I've done wrong. If no man or woman is going to come forth and make a claim, you know, I wish to be let go. Simple things, you know, just, you know, just, you know, rely upon the common law. You know, and it drives them nuts when more and more people are going to learn the common law. It's going to drive them totally crazy. You know, it's uh, it, it's just going to drive them crazy when more and more people go into court and they understand what's going on. Because any kind of like me and Gus sometimes, we talk about like a social contract. And uh, all social contracts are divine rights of kings. So at one time, there was something called divine rights of kings. And the king thought that he was given special power by God to do what he wanted to do over his subjects. So then the social contracts came along like in the 17th, 18th centuries, and they started to call them uh, social contracts. And they started calling them uh, constitutions or, you know, charters. They started to call them, uh, you know, acts of parliament. So then now another group of men replaced the kings into saying, we have authority and control over our subjects. But at one time, the king would say, well, God chose me. You know, it was like a lottery. God chose me. He was lucky to draw. I just happened to be the king. So 
so you all have to bow down and kiss my ass because I won the lottery this time. Just like if you won the lottery today, you'd be a billionaire and you'd make everybody bow down and kiss your ass because you got a billion dollars. And everybody would just bow down and kiss your ass because you're rich. They'd all fall over themselves trying to get, you know, to be near you. And uh, it's the same thing with the Divine Rider Kings where they were led to believe that they were special. Well, now you got these politicians who they believe they're special. And they believed that they were chosen by the people. And they believed that now they, they were chosen by the people to control the people. And uh, the only problem is that they were, con- they, they were chosen by their, their subjects. They weren't chosen by the people. They were chosen by their subjects. So those people that they, they're, they're, they're subjects, those are the people that they have control over. But if you just say, you explain to them when you get to the court, I'm not part of this legal society. I'm a man. I have, you know, I have no understanding of your, you know, your legally, you know, process or your procedures. And um, like I said, they can't hold you liable for something that you do not, that you're not a part of. It's like I explained all the times about that um, black guy from uh, whatever those, uh, one of those African countries came by. He was an uncle. And he got his eight-year-old niece pregnant, and she popped out a baby when she was nine in New York State. And uh, they had to drop all the charges and let him go, because where he's from, that's a wonderful thing to do. He doesn't believe he's done anything wrong, and he's not from that society, so he can't be held liable. So the only other thing I could think of with... um, um With... um uh, The social contract... Because Gus brought that up yesterday with me. We were talking about social contracts. And, um, yes, you know, you owe a duty to your community, you know, to pay, like, some sort of uh, taxes, like some sort of uh, property taxes, I believe. Or if you can't afford property taxes, then you come up with uh, a way to either uh, take care of the local parks, help rake the leaves, or um, wash the fire trucks, or join a volunteer fire department, or join an EMT service. You know, but you got to give back to the community. And like Gus and I were saying, a lot of people who listen to our shows, I think he's saying some guy named Mike up in Canada, he, he kind of took it to heart when I said to him, who are you going to bring to court with you to show you, to show the court, like your courtiers, who, who are you going to show, who are you going to bring to court? Are you going to bring a priest or a pastor or a deacon? Are you going to bring a, a, the chief of the fire department? Are you going to bring somebody of the park service? who says that when we ring the fire bell, he comes out and helps put out forest fires, or when we need help raking leaves in the autumn and the fall when the leaves start falling, you know, he's the first one down there helping us clean up the parks. You know, what? how are you going to show that you are a, a, like an upstanding member of your community? Of your, you know, how are you going to show that you're a good man, that you put, you know, that you do your part? If you don't want to pay property taxes, yeah, okay, that's fine. And, you know, do something else. And if you want to go above and beyond, pay your property taxes and volunteer for social services. Give up some time to help out your fellow man who can't help themselves. And then the judge will base, you know, what by your actions and your inactions, he'll make a determination of, you know, it'll, it'll go in your favor. He'll say, wow, look at all these people he's got going up here. He's got, you know, Boy Scout clubs. He's got, you know, uh, he's got, uh, you know, church people coming up here saying he's a wonderful man. He's got the fire department people coming up here. So, uh, like I said, so that way if if you do fall behind in something and you can't pay something, just like I did with Jimmy. When Jimmy, uh, well, the guy who has a shop down the road here, when he went bankruptcy court, I stood there and I said, look, I've known this man for many years. And if he's owed a debt, he's always paid on a debt. You know, yes, this man is, you know, uh, doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, green money at this point point in time, but he is of great worth and value. You know, he can produce a lot of work from his hands. I said, I've seen he's very mechanically inclined, and uh, he could chop down trees, and he's very, uh, he he, he can make a living. You know, he can pay back his debts. He's just asking for some more time, and to accept whatever, you know, whatever he can afford at this point in time to pay on the debts. That's all he's asking for. He's just asking some more time until he gets back on his feet. So when I went to court, it's like being, like I said, it's being like a character witness. And uh, so far, everything's been going fine with him. 
in the, the shop in his house and stuff. It's it's been uh, it'll be almost a year this November. It's since it's been nice and quiet. And uh, we did some interesting things with the county down here to hopefully uh, slow it down quite a bit as well. But, um, yeah, like I said, uh, I can't wait to hear from Mark, you know, when he comes on to tell us what the hell happened. And uh, what was funny is the man from uh, Boston, um, John, uh, called up the court clerk. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to do. I was going to do that on the show, man. Ask uh, Gus or John if he knows what the court clerk's phone number is down there in the, in the state or the county that he's in and have people on the show call him up and find out, wait a second, the man was there. You know, he was in court. How come you're still holding him? And just seeing how many people would call up to help Mark. Hey, Kyle. Yeah. Kyle, this is John. Um, I've, I've done that to the point of uh, being obnoxious with the uh, clerk down there because I was on the phone with Mark during the entire thing. So I heard everything in the courtroom. I heard everything at the clerk's office. Wow. I know the the wording that Mark put into the court. By the way, another interesting point. You, you did a good job reiterating it, but there was another point that's pretty important. After he put the notice into the court and he said, I, I showed up, I, I, here's the time I showed up, I asked out loud five times, does anyone have a claim here against me? I asked the court reporter when the magistrate was going to show up. Even after he did all that, he went back to the court to see if the magistrate came. Right. And the magistrate wasn't there, so he he definitely made a diligent effort. Right. How do you know the court, the magistrate didn't drop dead and die of a heart attack? You know, he's not a. See, I understand the the bailiff has to be there, and I understand the prosecutor has to be there, and the defendant has to be there because they're a party. To, they, they, that's that's their job. That's their roles. That's their positions. That's their status. But Mark never accepted the, the status of that of being a defendant. He always challenged his jurisdiction. I know that. There's no doubt about it. He was going to challenge jurisdiction. So, like I said, I guarantee what happened, man, is the judge just walked in, called out everybody's name alphabetically. They got to the letter H. He didn't show up. You know how fast they move courts. They just call out once. They call out twice. He doesn't walk forward. The judge says, fine, issue a warrant for his arrest. I mean, they do it like lightning. The judge isn't going to go walking around and asking somebody, hey, have you, have you seen this guy? You know, and then, like, say the lady before him was Susie Johnson, you know, letter J. Is Susie Johnson, is Susie Johnson here? No, no. Okay, issue a warrant out for arrest. Next case, uh, Hollings. Uh, Hollings here? Um, no, no Hollings. Issue a warrant for his arrest. Kelly, is Kelly here? And then, like, Kelly will come forward. Yes, Kelly, okay, come forward. It's just that simple. They, they move through those cases so fast, and they issue warrants out. Like they're issuing a, a, a bubble gum or toilet paper, sheets of toilet paper. They they don't even think. They just say, okay, warrant, issue another warrant, up, oh, issue another warrant. They they don't even think before they start doing it. How kind of that's messing with people's lives. They don't care. But that's what I'm saying. You know what? The because it was funny. Yeah, you you said that. Um, you said to the court clerk, hey, I, I recognize your voice. You know, does right. Mark have any of this stuff? Does Mark have any of this stuff recorded? Oh yeah, he record he did, and, and the, at least he told me he did. I know, I didn't hear him play it back, but Mark's pretty diligent like that, so I bet he did. The other thing oh, is, correct. Clark started to argue with me on the phone. By the way, I said, "Listen, I'm a witness. You better get that through your head. I'm a witness. I heard you. <laughs> I heard what the court reporter said. You have a man in prison. You falsely imprisoned this man. He appeared twice, not once, twice. And and he said, "Well, this is over my head." Then he and he hung up. Well, what's we funny is, um, what I'm saying is, we got to get this recording of Marks. I was hoping you had a recording of We got to get the recording of Marks on this show or upload it to this show. And yeah. then there could be hundreds of people that could say, hey, we witnessed, uh, you know, we heard that he was in court and we heard him talking to a court clerk. We, we heard him on a radio show. And, uh, you know, they say, like, wow, you know, he, you know, he's on a radio show. He's like, yes, the whole conversation is on a radio show, and you guys could hear it for yourselves exactly what happened. So Mark's going to have a hell of a lawsuit, you know, if he just um, if he if he if he if he keeps his head straight. I'm sure he'll do great if he doesn't panic. I kind of think that's what happened a little bit. I think he might have got a little bit uncomfortable because Mark's such a nice guy. I think when he's 
confronted with not nice people, he gets a little bit, um, I don't know, a little uncomfortable maybe. Oh, well, you got to figure, too, the poor Mark guy, he, um, he doesn't want to upset his neighbors. He's the kind of guy who would rather just go to jail and go with the cops than have the cops standing at his house for five days straight in the standoff. You know, and, you know, with the cops' cars blasting their horns outside saying, open the door, just open the door, make it easier on your neighbors. You know, your landlord's going to kick you out if you don't, you know, open the door. You know, so Mark is more like cares about what his neighbors think, you know, that he doesn't want to hurt his neighbors' feelings or hurt his landlord's feelings or make the landlord get upset. Me, I couldn't care less, man. <laughs> My landlord would just laugh if the cops pulled up. They're like, yeah, and that, that, that sounds about right, man. He's like, well, kick him out. It's like, well, I ain't doing anything. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> but Monk, Monk would be more afraid of losing, like, losing his apartment, losing his cars, losing his dog. Me, I'm not afraid of losing any of that stuff. My family will take it and my friends, you know, my neighbors will take care of all my stuff for me. Yeah, so I'm not, right. I'm, you know what? You know, any landlord, after all, realizes that there's no, no threat to him because he actually never did anything wrong. So the minute they actually get out of that scared tactic and bullying, they recognize that, then they become a lot more free. And they think, you know what? Well, I don't know. You know what? I don't know Jack. All I know is, what, you want that guy? Well, go get him. What are you telling me for? You think I'm his yeah. dad? You think I'm his mum? No. Go kick his ass. It's not my problem. You go do it yourself. And when you, you kind of speak like that, then people start to realize, oh, you know what, this guy, is, he's right, he's not his dad, he's not his mom. Let's go there and let's go, let's go sort it out ourselves. And then the landlord will get in his own position. I always tell my own tenants as well, and say, look, you know, you've got a problem, you know what, I, I can hold my own. If you, you can't hold your own, then you tell them to ring me, and I'll tell them to piss off. <laughs> Simple as that. If you can't do it, I'll do it. Simple as that. Yeah, did um, yeah, it goes um, yeah, Bali's a landlord, so uh, <laughs> yeah, you're getting somebody from experience there. But do you know, do you know the phone number down there, um, uh, for uh, Atlanta, wherever he's been, with the court clerk's office? Do you know the phone yeah. number down there? Oh yeah, I, yeah. I dialed it so yeah. many times. By the way, just a little FYI on that, I left messages in in three other clerks' voicemails. Oh until I finally got a hold of the guy. And I recognized his voice. I, I got a hold yeah. of him and said, I know you. I, I, I remember your voice. And he got all nervous <laughs> on that. And he says to me, uh, he says, well, Mr. Hollingsworth was supposed to stay there until the judge got there, no matter how long it took. And I said, really? So so a, a year, would that be reasonable if it took him a friggin' year? And he, he kind of got a little quiet. And he said, well, the rules are, and I said, there are no rules in common law. You know, you're, you're talking statutory, and and that's when he, he started to get real nervous. I think what they're going to do, my guess, and your guess would certainly be a lot better founded, but I think they're going to, when he comes out of there, they're going to give him a document to sign that he won't hold them yeah. liable, and they'll, they'll let him out. They're going to pull some kind yeah, of Yeah, damn right. Sign this, don't hold us liable, and we'll let you out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, that won't hold up. Not in common law. That'll hold up in the statutory world, but it won't hold up in their, uh, it, it won't hold up. So, uh, like I said, it's funny that, um, yeah, because statutes is based on something that's, um, something that's like a written on contract, something that's solid. You know, the statutes, you know, what, what they did to him, uh, I'm going to love to see where they're going to show that he has to stay there until the judge shows up. I'm going to love it them to show them that. Show me. Show me where it actually says that. Show me. Show me where it says I have to sit there. If I get called to be here at 9 o'clock, that I have to sit here and wait until you show up. They'll say, well, it's an unwritten rule. Everybody knows it. Oh, really? Well, I don't know it. All I know is I had an appointment for 9 o'clock. Uh, it was 9.30. I'm done. I'm going home. So, like I said, that's... that's the, uh, it's, it's, because... You want the okay, number? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Somebody could try to type it in because I'm gonna to have to log out. That's what I'm gonna do right now. I gotta log out and log back in. So if I lose the uh, my phone to you, Polly, just just uh, unmute me again. Okay. Because I think I gotta I gotta log in with a different screen name because you 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 got the board, so um I can't type anything on the board while while you're on the board. Oh yeah. Yeah. So um. 
Yeah, so like I said, what was the, like, if you could give the phone number out, that's fine. You could say it, and then somebody will type it. And uh, yeah. what I'm saying is this is what happened with me and TalkShoe. On one of my shows, I said, um, TalkShoe's giving me a hard time. T- TalkShoe won't advertise that I'm, I'm on live now for whatever reason, but they're advertising everybody else's show is live, but they won't do mine. So I told everybody, why don't you call TalkShoe? They're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and ask them, why won't they allow Call's show to appear live? Call wants to actually pay you money, whatever it is, $10, $20 a week, whatever it is to advertise, but you won't accept his money. Why not? And they said, well, you know, we'll ex- we we choose whose money we're going to accept and whose money we're not going to accept. And, uh, you know, w- w- we might choose call eventually, but right now we don't want his money. We don't, we're not going to, prom- we're not going to allow him to promote his show. And so, but they promote everybody else's show. It looks ridiculous. And you see those like shows that are, you know, are promoted. They have zero uh, guests, you know, like two, three people on their shows. It's like, Okay, why won't you let somebody who's got hundreds of people, you know, let everybody know that hey, if you want to tune in now, call lunch your show is on, but they won't accept my money for whatever reason. I suppose so a good way to do that is that hey, fine, I want to uh, do my radio show here, and I've got so many listeners, and, and the last one, you say, oh yeah, yeah, you know what, I did a bit of research. Yeah, there's some weird guy here called, called Carl Lentz, and he's doing some uncommon law thing, and. I've noticed on his on certain days you don't you don't allow him to show up live. Why is that? Is that connected yeah. to me? Well, that's what happened. Is talk show people finally called me up and they said you've got to have these people stop calling us. We'll just pull your show totally. You know because <laughs> there's, there's hundreds of people calling them. You know there's hundreds of people emailing them. You know so like I said that's what's always a lot of fun. Is to, did they tell you, um, John, to stop calling them or to keep calling them? Or what did the court clerk tell you? To leave them alone? Well, or? Was, his last words out of his mouth is, because I, I started pounding him with, with uh, how his, his mock had um, made it clear to them he was only in there under the common law. Right. But his last words were to me, this is way over my head. And then he hung up. <laughs> yeah. I was getting kind of aggressive with him. Yeah, because but he didn't tell you to stop calling or nothing like that, huh? No, no, no. Good. But he did what they did do is they apparently uh, Gus knows more about this end of it than I do. They told his um, his girlfriend to tell us to stop calling there because I made it appear like a lot of people were calling because I kept calling all their voicemails. <laughs> right. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. To stop calling that, why? To, 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 you know, like I said, you know, I'd call up and say, why do you want me to stop calling? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, why? Why do you want me to stop calling? Can you tell me why? You know, what we're supposed to show no concern for our friend? What, 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 was, what are we supposed to do? You want us to come down there and pick it? You know, you want us to put up a protest march? I mean, what, what do you want us to do? You you just want us to go away? I mean, wh- what do you want us to do? If you want us to just go away, why don't you just let the guy go? You know, he's, mm-hmm. you know, has he has he done anything wrong? No, he never appeared as a defendant. You're looking for a defendant named Mark. He said that he would be glad to appear to any man that he's done wrong to, but he will not play the silly defendant game with no silly statutes. He won't do it. Right. He refuses to play the statute game. He, he won't do it. He's going to appear as a man. He does not feel that he's bound by statute. He has no contract with you people. He's not part of your society. He didn't say that he would have, you know, he didn't say, you know, that he was an active member of your club. You know, as far as he's concerned, he's an idiot to whatever you folks wish of him. You want to talk to him man to man? Oh, he's totally competent. You want to start talking some legal jargon? and try to hold him liable for doing something wrong in your little legalese society, he has no clue about the legal society or the terms of art or the jargon that you folks use. And he doesn't believe as a man that he's held liable. And it, there's any requirement of him as a man to uh, be knowledgeable. So, uh, like I said, you know, it, it's going to be fun if he, um, if he really knows what he's doing, if he's starting to figure it out. You know, the it's clerk, going to be a lot of. The clerk is very clear because I made him very clear that Mark has a claim for false imprisonment. I made that real clear to him. I didn't do it in a threatening way. I just said, "You, you realize the man showed up. 
He went to the clerk's office. None of you people knew where the magistrate was. Then he went back there. And he has a witness. So you, you're really clear now, aren't you? And no. the guy said, yeah. Right. And what happened if you had to leave for a medical emergency? Right. Did anybody ask why he had to leave? Did he say why it was so imperative that the appointment be kept on time, on schedule? The only thing that happened was the judge was in contempt of court. Mark's not in contempt of court. The only person who was in contempt of court was the judge. Right. The judge was had a, had a duty and a, a responsibility to appear at a certain time. Now, if the judge feels is derelict in his duty, how is Mark liable? If the judge can't be bothered to show up, how is the how is how is how is everybody else in the how is a man liable for the acts of this judge? A man's got a life. A man's only got so much time in his life. A man can't just afford to sit there and waste hours of his life. And everybody knows that Florida case where the Florida everybody tries to use that uh, uh, the Florida court ruling was that every man's life is worth whatever twenty seven thousand dollars a day or something like that for having this man wrongfully uh, held in uh, prison down there in Florida, which I'm more sure more could use to his benefit. Saying that they issued out a warrant, you know, that, that for, you know, for a uh, Mark Hollingsworth, when the man appeared on behalf of Mark that day, but there's nothing expressly written on that summons or that citation or that it's like being invited to summons is like being invited to a party. There's nothing in that summons that says you, you have to wait for the hostess or the host to show up for the party. If you show up for the party, you showed up. You dropped off your gift at the door. Okay, I made my presence. Okay, I made my appearance. Okay, I'm going home. Well, wait a second. You invited this party. You've got to stay until the very end. Um, no, that's not what my invitation says. I'm going home. Does it expressly say I have to be there? No. Then I'm going to hell home. I did my duty. I did my obligation. I showed up. Now, what what part of that part didn't I do? Oh, I was supposed to stay longer. Oh, I was supposed to wait for the square dance and the rumba. Oh, I left before the rumba, huh? Oh, well, excuse me. Oh, no, no excuse. We're going to put you in a cage. Oh, really? Because I, I, I stick around to the very last act. Is that, is that it? So it just makes you laugh when you see, um, you know, how, how they're going to try to defend themselves with this. And you can kind of see where Mark's going to go with it. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. To see, uh, you know, what you know what the the jury's going to determine. You know, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, like I said, it all depends how well Mark can handle this. You know. Hey, Carl. Yeah. Uh, Mike and uh, Mike GM, uh, he's uh, on the phone, and he was the, he was on the phone with Mark when Mark got arrested. And yeah. he's, uh, he's if you want to hear hear what happened you, when that went down. Bobby's Bobby's gonna Bobby's gonna unmute him. I can't I can't do anything. I gotta log I gotta actually log out. What's his username? Gus, what's his username? His username is dot 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 i. Oh, him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, dot, dot, dot. Hi. Hey, thanks, Bally. Hey, man. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, man. What's the story? Oh, I'm uh, doing all right, man. You need, to, you need to straighten your name out, man. They know who you are out right there. <laughs> it's my code name. That's your code name, huh? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I was on the phone with Mark, and he was uh, playing a clip of Carl. So there was a little bit of noise going on, but I heard uh, a knock at the door. And then Mark, for some reason, just opened the door. And uh, the officer, I couldn't hear what he said at first. And then Mark's, Mark asked, is there a warrant? And he said, yeah, there's a warrant. And Mark said, is the warrant signed? And the officer said, yeah, of course it's signed. What, do you think I'm going to show up here without a signature? And then Mark asked, is there a bond? Sir, what is your name? 
is there a bond? What is your name, sir? And then he gave his name. And the last thing I heard was the cops say, give me the phone. So I think Mark kind of choked when he saw the uniform. Yeah. I'm talking. Yeah, instead of saying, give me the phone, I say, I'd be glad to. Is that an order? Yeah, bring it down on it. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking he should have said, uh, I wish to remain silent or yeah. something. Uh, th- I'm in my domestic authority. Don't cross the threshold or something. And just say, are you here in official, uh, you know, police capacity? He said, yeah, are you here on a state, on a state business? Yes, then I wish to have my attorney present any any time of questioning. Do you wish to question me? Yes, then let me get my attorney down here. The cop will say, okay, how long that'll take? So I'm not sure. You know, maybe take a couple of days. I'm not sure. And then my attorney's free. But I have the right to remain Right, I have the right to remain silent. I have the right that any time I'm going to be questioned to have an attorney present. Because am I under arrest? He's going to be like, well, yes, as soon as you tell me your name is Mark, you're damn right you're under arrest. Yeah. 